on Sunday morning and we arrive at church as a teenager not understanding what it means that it's going to work out and you just just living going through life thinking that you're going to live forever because everybody that you encounter is older than you but then you get to a point in your life when mama's not there and daddy's not there and the things that you thought you had security in just could not hold up and so you had to find out for yourself that the Lord is on your side and so we know that we can say what Paul in Romans 8 28 that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and who are called according to to his purpose. Amen. Won't you bless God for our choir this morning? Please forgive me. I failed to, to mention that they actually are going to be ministering this afternoon at 3 p.m. at the New Mount Nebo Baptist Church in Capitol Heights, Maryland. Um, that's at 7501 Walker Mill Drive right off of Central Avenue. Um, at 3 p.m. our choir is going to be ministering there. And so if you can make it, I pray that uh, you do support them. Amen. The Exodus, the 17th chapter. Exodus, the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 7. This should be a very familiar passage of Scripture because it's the one that we preached from last week. And we're returning to it again this week, but just at a different angle. You're there, say amen. It's there for you on the screens. And then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. And you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I pray that you would bear with me, bear, bear with me on a few moments on the subject entitled Fight for Your Destiny. Part one, fight for your destiny. Part one, let us pray. God, we thank you now for this moment that you called us to. God, we pray now that we would be able to receive your word, that it would penetrate heart, mind, soul, and spirit so that we would understand that as we continue to journey to destiny, there will be moments when we have to fight. And I'll fight, Lord God, to ensure that we are with you and that everything you said will come to pass. And so, Lord God, we ask for your angelic hosts to be with us now in this moment. We pray, Lord God, that you would just open up heaven now, Lord God, let there be a clear connection. Let there be no traffic, Lord God. 
on the, from the command center unto us, Lord God, but only a clear channel to be able to hear from you so that whatever it is you choose to deposit, your people would have it. But if there is traffic that comes, God, I pray that your warring angels will fight on our behalf in the name of Jesus to set the atmosphere so that your people who are victorious will walk away knowing that they are victorious. We thank you and we love you. I prayed as I prayed many times before. I'm not able, incompetent, insufficient of this task that stands before me. However, with the help of your Holy Ghost, allow your word to come forth with power and conviction. Truly, Lord, drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love that I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. It's simply all that I can do. This is my prayer in the perfect, powerful, and precious name that is Jesus. And all those who agree did say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated at the presence of our Lord. Fight for your destiny. Fight for your destiny. I believe that there is a misconception in regards to destiny. Some of us feel that destiny happens automatically. That at the set time, and the set place, everything just lines up. The truth is, that's not always true, especially in the kingdom of God. Because in order for us to see destiny fulfilled, you and I have to be willing to participate with God in the fulfillment of destiny. We cannot sit idle. We cannot be apathetic. And we cannot say, God, you just do it, and I'll just stand over here. We have to be able to walk with God, receive the commands that God gives so that God will guide us to put us in the proper position so when destiny comes, we can be able to fulfill it. The truth of the matter is, if you desire destiny to be fulfilled in your life, you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to fight for it. Someone said that anything worth having is worth fighting for. And the truth of the matter is, if I could be honest, everything that God has promised me in my life that has come to fruition, I had to participate and fight for the fulfillment to happen. And I believe that this is something that's relevant in this dispensation in the kingdom of God. Because if you really think about it, fighting is something that all of us have had to encounter at some point. It was just a matter if we were fighting for something that was good or we fighting just to be fighting. The most played song that won the award on the gospel airwaves in 2015 was the song by Brian Courtney Wilson that said, life is worth fighting for. You know the song, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, all you have done for me, and nothing shall separate me from your love when there's so much more still worth fighting for. This is where we see Israel in our text. It's obvious that they have a fight that is within him within them. Only problem is they're fighting the wrong people. And on the journey to destiny, you have to be sure that when you fight, you fight for the right reason and that you fight the right people. Here they are at Rephidim, camped, migrated from the wilderness of sin at the command of God. They've been traveling for about three months, and God brings them to this place. When they come to this place, they discover that there is no water. 
And because there is no water, the text says they now began to contend with Moses, saying that Moses has brought them out there for them to die. In fact, the exact words are in verse 3, that you brought us out here to kill us and our children and our livestock. It's evident that they are ready to fight because they want to stone him and eradicate him and his testimony from history. Only problem is Moses was the wrong person they were supposed to be fighting. It does, amazes me that these children of Israel and the trek that they have been on this amount of time, they get to the place where they're trying to stone the one that God has sent to them to lead them to God. All because they're thirsty and they have nothing to drink. Doesn't make sense to me that they would rather die here and before the time they said that their lives were better in Egypt. Although they are free, liberated from their bondage, what they're saying is they would much rather be slaves in Egypt. They would much rather have slave labor with slave quotas to make a certain amount of bricks they would much rather have the scraps of slave food. They would much rather be in a culture where the decree went out to kill all Hebrew boys, less than two, because of the mass population of the Israelites. They would much rather be in an environment where they were watched and guarded all of their life as opposed to being free now. Never mind how God has brought them to this place now. They would have much rather be controlled by someone who did not have their agenda, they would rather be slaves. Shiloh Baptist Church, I pray in the name of Jesus that we never get to a place where we express an ungrateful attitude for everything that God has done for us in our life. Because Israel is for the most part saying that everything that you've done to this point does not matter and that we will find where we are. But I pray in the name of Jesus that we will not express that type of attitude towards our God who has brought us so far and brought us such a long way and has been there for us all the time. Because although Israel wanted the shelter of a slave, we don't have the shelter of one who was a slave. We have a shelter of one who is the ultimate deliverer. In fact, he has all power because his name is El Shaddai. And he is the almighty God. And he is omnipotent. And he is omnipresent. And he is omniscient, all-knowing. And if this God who has all power, who is all-knowing, and who is everywhere at the same time, is the one that is fighting for me, then I just suggest that I need to praise him and thank him for everything that he has done for me. Because this God has the power to speak one word and shift the entire atmosphere and the course because of the power that is in his name. And I know that God is speaking to us in this dispensation of what he's saying to the Shiloh Baptist Church. I've heard it and I believe it and I will take it with me that God wants to see his glory in this place. That he wants to rain down and saturate the place with the dew of heaven so that everybody that is seated here and when they enter into the doors will be able to experience and know that there is a God in heaven who's bringing heaven to earth a deliverer and a healer and a changer of minds and hearts and he wants to be here so in the name of Jesus this place will be a place of gratitude this place will be a place of thanksgiving this place will be a place where we will always lift up our hands and give God praise for who God is and what he's done and what he's going to do and if he still doesn't do it that does not change the fact that he's not God and if because he is God that means I was created to bless him and praise him so however he chooses to show up I will lift my hands and say thank you Lord and bless him for the God that he is in the name of Jesus I speak to every spirit that's trying to stop 
the praise in this house and I say that there is no devil in hell that will be able to stop the plan of God in here and if you happen to be a participant in the plan that the devil is using I'm serving you notice and putting you on course because you are not operating of him who is the spirit of the living God but you are betwixt and confused and if you keep on fighting in this church you will find yourself by yourself or better yet you may be speaking and prophesying your own death our God is serious about his house and his people and what he wants to do here and because there is only one power source in the house of God it's not the pastor, it's not the trustees, it's not the deacon, it's not the choir, it's not the pew member. There is one power source. That source name is Jesus. And because this is his house and his church and he has all power, he is the one that you got to link up with. And if we are not on one accord, somebody's lying. In the name of Jesus. This is the place. That God was trying to get Israel to. He recognized that there was a fight in them. But the problem was they didn't know who to fight. And so because of their dysfunction and their slave mentality, they fight the very people that have been sent to help them. Because they didn't have an identity. Text says that they contend with Moses to contend or to quarrel. Is to have an intense opposition against something or someone. And the truth of the matter is because they did not know who they were. And because of their dysfunction. And because of their attitude. It just seems that when God brought them to a place. Because verse 1 says at the commandment of the Lord. They left the wilderness of sin and came to Rephidim. And because what they thought was going to be at a Rephidim was not at a Rephidim, now they turn on the one that God has sent to help him. Here is the first point. You better make sure as you fight for your destiny that you choose the proper enemy. Please ensure that you choose the proper enemy. It's right there in the text. It says they contend with Moses, telling Moses that there is no water for us to drink. Never mind have Moses has been patient with his people. Has he walked alongside them, listened to all their complaints, listened to everything that he said, and now they're at a place where they're ready to stone him because he's following God, and God told him to come to this place, and now they're at this place, and because they don't like this place, even though they don't know who they are, they are ready to kill him. This is crazy. Dysfunctional. Ungrateful. Demonic, if you will. To the place that your leader, who is following God, who is taking you here, and now you're ready to dethrone him, and all he is doing is following the will of the Father. Can I say this to you? And I pray you receive it in the name of Jesus. Shallow Baptist Church, I am not your enemy. I am your brother in Christ. I love you. The people beside you are not your enemy. We are all on the same team, reaching for the same goal, serving the same God who died on the cross for each and every one of us. And if we are going to get where God is going to take us, we have to make sure that we choose the proper enemy. It's time for the backbiting and the fighting and the foolishness and all these things in the house of God to be dismissed. Don't you understand that you are being deceived by either a Jezebel spirit or an Absalom spirit. The Jezebel spirit seeks to control everything. The Absalom spirit seeks to divide the church. And if you find yourself being divisive or being controlling, you are under the unction of a spirit that is not of the Holy God, but you are being deceived. So in the name of Jesus, I release a spirit of Jehu against Jezebel. I pray that the hounds of heaven will eat her flesh and cause her to get up out of here and I release a warring spirit of the sword of the Lord to come up against Absalom and to kill him because this 
is the kingdom of God and in the kingdom of God God gives authority and when God gives authority to the man or woman that God gives authority when they speak it has to happen so as pastor of this house with the apostolic authority that has been granted unto me I speak to every demonic spirit that's trying to stop the move of God in this house and I tell you take you and your demons and go back to hell where you are from and stay there you don't have any power here you don't have any jurisdiction here my God owns everything and because my God owns everything and I'm a part of my God and I belong to him this will be the kingdom of God and we will serve him in the name of Jesus your enemy is after your soul and his name is the devil that is the one that you are fighting how dare you fight your brother and sister in Christ who has been saved by the same blood that you have been. So you need to check yourself and look at your history and your past to see why it is you have this contentious spirit inside of you. Because if you don't know why you're fighting and who you're fighting, you're just a loose cannon. Which means you hurt the people around you because the truth is you're not happy with who you are yourself choose the right enemy Moses was just following the commandment of God said right here is verse 1 according to the commandment of God they came to Rephidim so I understand it. Israel knew how to be a slave just didn't know how to be free they understand what it means to be oppressed and to be subjugated just didn't understand liberty so for all of these years they've been slaves and now for three months they're free so naturally they revert back to the way in which they operated and how they've been operating because that's all they knew they didn't have the understanding they didn't have the Bible to read the law hadn't been given yet they had not yet been to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments God had not instituted them as a nation and given them the practices of how to worship them. They didn't know how to divide and conquer. They didn't understand how it was to act in a governmental state as God as a theocracy because they've only been slaves. I get it. That's their excuse. The problem is you and I don't have that excuse. Because we have Bibles. We have apps. We have pastors. We have preachers. We have churches that we go to. In fact, we got the Holy Ghost living inside of us who is the ultimate teacher. So if we're having all these problems, what is the problem? I understand you got a fight in you. That's good. But make sure that it comes from a righteous indignation. You want to fight, then fight the injustices that our children are experiencing as our young men are being shot down in the street. You want to fight? Fight against the Boko Haram who are keep abducting these Nigerian girls. And for some odd reason, we can't find where they are. Although we can find all this money for wars and everything else. But in Africa, we can't find no money to help these girls that's being abducted. You want to fight? Fight the school system that's trying to create a pipeline to prison for our young boys boys and women not teaching them the essentials that they need you want to fight fight for criminal justice reform so it is like George Zimmerman can't take the gun that he used to kill Trayvon Martin and try to auction it off and make it as a piece of history you want to fight there's plenty of things you can be mad about but don't fight each other and definitely don't fight the children of God in God's house take the fight out there where the fight is since you're so contentious Fight the good fight of faith. Make sure that the kingdom of God will be advanced. Since you want to fight. And if you're going to fight, make sure you're fighting the right enemy and the right fight. Can I push it further? Can I also help you to understand? Not just that I'm not your enemy, but God is not your enemy. You may say, okay, theologian, I got a problem with your supposition to suggest that God would be my enemy. I'm not saying uh, that God is your enemy. What I'm saying is that you shouldn't think that God is your enemy because the manner in which you act suggests that God would be your enemy. It's right here in the text says, uh, they contend with Moses and then they test God to the point where they say, is God 
among us or not. Which suggests if he's for us, then he will be with here, be with us here. But because he is not here, he must not be for us. Which means if he is not for us, then he's against us. And if he's against us, that means he's our enemy. But because of their lack of spiritual understanding, nor the attributes of God, of understanding that God is omnipresent and that God is everywhere, just because you can't perceive him does not mean that he's not there. In the fact, I can't understand why they would choose to test God. Yahweh, Jehovah, El Shaddai, when it was God, the one that they cried out to. And God sent Moses from the backside of the desert. And God sent Moses and put him in Egypt and told Pharaoh to let my people go. And God was responsible for all the plagues that eventually got them out of Egypt. And God was responsible for bringing them out of Egypt with the silver and the gold and the livestock. So they left Egypt, a rich nation, and God was the one who ensured that they would have their safety. Because when the Egyptian army came after them, it was God who changed his position to keep the enemy at bay while they walked on through the Red Sea on dry ground. And it was God who they saw the Egyptians slain and washed up on the rivers. And it was God who made sure that the waters of Mara were bitter. And now that they were sweet and it was God who opened the pantry of heaven and gave them food to eat by manna and quail. And it was God who's been walking with them all this way. And now they get to a place where they're thirsty. And all of a sudden they have the audacity to ask the question, is God not among them? If you're going to test God, test him in your giving. Because that's the only place he said to test him. So you want to test God? Tithe. You want to test God? Give unto God. That's what he said. If you've just got a test in you and you want to test him, test him in that. Because that's what he said. But don't test him because you don't know where he is. Especially when the things aren't working about the way you think. They should be. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you got on a cross and died for anybody's sins? When was the last time you were born of a virgin named Mary? When was the last time you wrought miracles and give sight to the blind? When was the last time you died for the church? When was the last time you redeemed humanity? You have the unmitigated gall to suggest that you're going to test him who was, is, and is to come, the almighty God, as if you got some power. Don't you know God just has to speak a word and you will be done? That it that's the power that he's had you want to test him you probably say to yourself I'm testing God here it is anytime you begin to explain doubt especially when God told you to do something and you express the doubt what you're doing is handing the exam and telling God to fill out your name because you are about to take a test why would you test the one who is just trying to build you up and to make sure that you're nurtured in a place and time where your faith can come alive and so that you can see him differently than you saw him before because he has something in store for you and has some plans for you. But you have to be able to handle what God is trying to bequeath unto you because if he gives it to you before your time, you will squander it and find yourself in the same position that you are when you began. God just has you in the incubator. You know what an incubator is, right? Certain little thing they have in the hospitals. Premature infants. To make sure that they spur growth and development. So the incubator is something where the environment is controlled. The key is that the environment is controlled. And since the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. And I belong to the most high God. In fact I'm the apple of his eye. Because that's what my Bible says. My Bible says that I am his child. They have the righteousness 
in God in Christ Jesus. That means wherever I am and because he is, I'm in a controlled environment. And in the controlled environment, God is trying to develop my growth and my strength. But I can't do that if I'm in something where I always get what I want. So I have to be in a place where I'm tested because God is doing the testing and not myself. So if I'm in the incubator, that means I'm being developed and growing. And it makes sense because Israel was in the infancy stage of a nation. They had not received any laws. They did not know what it was to worship God. They were in the infancy of a station of a nation. And all God was trying to do was to bring them to himself at Mount Sinai. Because God understood once I get you to where I am. You would be able to see and look back over your life and see how I lined up everything with perfect symmetry for you to see me and recognize that I am the Lord thy God who has brought you to this place. Don't worry if you find yourself in the wilderness. It's a controlled environment. Don't worry if you find yourself in the desert with God who is a factor. It's a controlled environment. Don't worry if you feel yourself hungry. I just believe if God gave manna and quail in the desert that God has enough power to feed me where I am. It doesn't matter if you find yourself being thirsty. Don't you understand that God has living waters so that you will never thirst again no matter where you our God is you are in the incubator you are in a controlled environment don't you understand the power of the God that you serve that's why the angel told Sarah is nothing anything too hard for God is anything too hard for him don't you understand that he's got enough power to break apart mountains don't you get that God can walk on water and defy the very laws that he created so the gravitational pull cannot take him under on a liquid service but he can hold back the laws of gravity and do whatever he pleases don't you understand that God can feed a lot with a little if it would just get into his hands don't you understand that God has enough power to bring the storm to steal the storm to speak peace to the storm to go to sleep in the storm to move the storm away in fact he is the author and creator of the storm to get you to see who he is don't you understand that God has enough power to speak anything into existence and all he has to do is utter the word and it shall be so. That's why we say the amen in Jesus name. Our God has enough power to meet you where you are and to do anything and everything. Is there anybody here that's ever experienced the power of God in your life? Do you know him to be your refuge and strength? A very present help in the time of trouble. Do you know God to be your light and your salvation therefore you don't have anything to fear do you know him to be strong on your side to make sure that he can hide you in the secret place of his tabernacle that's the God that we serve and our God has enough power to be able to keep you in perfect peace if your mind would just be stayed on him that's the God that we serve that's the God that we honor that's the God that we worship that's the God that we adore and our God God has enough power in the name of Jesus to keep us even when we don't want to be kept. God is not your enemy. Can I push it further? The truth of the matter is the only fight you need to overcome is the fight within you. Because the only person you're fighting is yourself. It's, I promise you it's right here. Israel contends with Moses they test God but the truth is although this was the effect of what they perceive to be quarreling or testing the true fight was from within here it is remember they have only been slaves and because they've only been slaves they've been operating as dysfunction because the masters job is to keep confusion in the camp and to keep fear running rampant and when the master does that and now the infighting happens the, the master understands if that there is infighting amongst one another then the people will never rise up together and the truth is they didn't know who to fight because they were fighting themselves 
because in their psycho-emotional makeup, they didn't know what it was to be free. And the reason they didn't know what it was to be free, because they'd never been free before. All they'd been was slaves, again, in an environment where they could not flourish and do whatever it is they felt was necessary. So now something new has been handed to them, and they don't know how to handle it. This is why God was trying to get them to Mount Sinai so he could show them who they were, give them a set of principles by which to live, establish them as a nation, because once God did that, they would now have an identity. The truth is Israel did not know who they were. And because they didn't know who they were, they had a fight on the inside. They didn't know their identity. They didn't know their purpose. They didn't know why they were called. And so therefore, they are just wandering aimlessly, although they should have been trusted the one that God has sent before them to get them to the mountain so that now they can meet this God and see the effects or rather the revelation of who he is so that they will be better and be stronger as a nation. Because if you flip a few more verses, there's a war. That's about to happen. And you need to know who you are before you go to war. Because if you don't know who you are before you go to war, you don't know the reason why you're fighting. And that's where we see Israel right now in our text. Damage, dysfunctional because of their past. And I speak to everybody here who's had to experience something in your past where people tried to put labels and names on you as if they were trying to assign you your identity. And what you're doing right now is trying to live out the very names that people put on you because they could not handle who you were. So they told you who you were, although it was antithetical and opposite to who God says that you are. You are not a failure. You are not a fluke. You are not a mistake. You are not someone that is downtrodden, but you are a child of the living God. And because you are a child of the living God, that means who God says you are is who you are. And the only way that you're going to overcome yourself and your past and outlive the assignment that people spoke to you is knowing who you are in Christ. And my Bible says that you are the head and that you are not the tail my Bible says you are the righteousness in Christ Jesus my Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made my Bible says you were created and crowned with glory my Bible says if you would just choose to obey him your name will be blessed because you'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field and blessed when you come and blessed when you go my Bible says that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus my Bible says you are a child of the living God and that's what Jesus was trying to do when he was on that cross saying come unto me all ye who labor and are heavy laden take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light can't you see him on this cross with his arms outstretched saying how to reach the masses, people of every birth. For an answer, Jesus gave the key. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. And just like Moses was leading Israel to Mount Sinai to meet him who is the great I am, Jesus got on Calvary's cross to draw all men and women unto him. And this is how you begin the drawing process. If you would just learn to open your mouth and lift him up like he said lift him up, then you will see a transference of people in the kingdom of God. They will begin to come over and be on the Lord's side because they will have an inquisitive nature trying to understand why is it that you come to this place every Sunday? Why is it that you read your Bible? Why is it that you pray? And all you say to him is that I live a life of praise and worship to the very God of my salvation who called me out of darkness into the marvelous light. And because he called me, and because of what he's done for me and because of who I know him to be I have no alternative or a choice but I got to worship him I've got to praise him I've got to bless his name I got to give him glory I've got to extol him I've got to exalt him I thought this was the eight o'clock crowd 
These are the serious Christians. You got out of bed early to come into the house of the Lord. And my Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And nothing is going to happen in your life until you get an attitude of gratitude and learn to bless the God of your salvation. And if you get to the point where you can lift your hands and praise your God, you will see your life begin to transform for the better. Is there anybody here? whose life is better because you learned how to bless his name. Is there anybody here who says you can make it because you learned how to bless his name? Is there anybody here that knows that calling on the name of Jesus is worth it and it's worth fighting for? doesn't happen by osmosis you got to be willing to participate with God you have to be willing to want to fulfill the will of God you can't sit back and be idle and say well God gonna do it God will do it problem is he'll do it without you then you won't be able to walk into the blessing that he has for you. We are one church advancing the kingdom of God. We are one church advancing the kingdom of God. One church advancing the kingdom of God. That means we have one agenda. That one agenda is to advance the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God means the principles by which God, who is king, chose to live his life. That's where the forgiveness and the love and the reconciliation and the giving and the compassion and the grace and the mercy. God's kingdom is antithetical to the world system. That's the challenge that we have as Christians. Because as we grow up, we so ingrained into this culture to the point where we actually glorify and exalt things of the culture to the point where we miss out on what the kingdom principles of God are. But if you are a child of the God, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And you do things differently. That's why we talk about giving and reciprocity and all these things. Because these are kingdom principles. And because Paul said it this way in Romans 7, that he sees a war in his members, a fighting within themselves. You have to fight for your very life, fight for your consciousness, fight for your mind, because your mind is the battlefield. See, if you win the battle in your mind, 75 to 80, if not 90% of the stuff that you're tripping over wouldn't even matter. Fight here. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Text also says we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. That's your worship and praise. You got to learn to worship and to praise Him to be able to see Him in a capacity. See, this, this, this ain't about church. This is relationship. And you need a healthy relationship with God. Once you have the healthy relationship, you'll know why it is you come to church. Not because mom and daddy said you coming. I, I thank God for mothers and fathers who tell their children to come to church, but it's going to come a day when mom and daddy ain't going to be there. And you got to make the decision for yourself. When God becomes your God and not just your mother and your father's God. Because when you see him in glory, he's not going to ask you who your mother and father is or what did they do. He's looking at you because you have a responsibility. And you know what? It can begin today if you would just choose to say yes. So as we stand all over the building, if you can, we offer you him who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus. And he is the one of whom 
we preach. In the text, God was trying to bring Israel to him at the mountain so he could establish them as a nation and give them an identity as a people. It's what Jesus did for us when he went to Calvary's cross. When he died, bled and died, he gave those who would believe after him an identity. That's what we call Christians because before then they were just followers of the way until they got to Antioch, Acts 11, 26, when they told them now that they're Christians, people that follow Christ. And to follow Christ is to follow the principles by which he showed us to live. And the church is his. We are the body of Christ. We are the arms, the legs, the feet, the hands, the eyes, and the ears. People know about Jesus because of the church. And the church is the people and not the building. Because if this tabernacle were to disappear and we would still be here, the work would still have to continue. Because we are the people of God. And we are his body. This God loves you. I don't care what anybody tells you. God loves you. God has always loved you and will forever love you. He just wants you to come to him so that you can experience more of the love that he has for you. So if you are here this morning and you've never said that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you're here this morning and you made that confession, but you don't have a church home, if you're here this morning and you find yourself wandering like a nomad trying to find a place to fit, and God so, so fit to bring you here in this house, we offer Christ, we also offer you the Shiloh Baptist Church. This is a place where God reigns and God rules, where he is the author and finisher of our faith. It is him that we lift up. It is him that we exalt. Everything we do is for him. And we love him because he first loved us. Amen. If that's you this morning, why don't you come? If that's you, why don't you come this morning? Don't delay it. Don't say I'll do it next week. I got time. Don't put that pressure on yourself. Just go ahead and make it official. Today. Come on. Come on, we know you're here. We know you're here. We know that God has been calling you to this place. You're not going to find anybody like Jesus. It's impossible. It's not going to happen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nobody greater than you. Shiloh, do me a favor. Talk to the person that's either beside you or behind you, someone you didn't come with, and ask them Nobody if they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Ask them if they have a church home. Nobody if they say no to either one of those questions, ask them if they would like to come down front and we can make their salvation and their membership official. Amen. So everybody's in the house is saved. Everybody got a church home. Listen, if you were somewhat hesitant, it's understandable. It's understandable. We don't want to push you. What you can do is after the